One year later, can I recommend PlayStation VR 2? Now I'm a touch late, I'm aware. But on the 22nd of February 2024, the PlayStation VR 2 turned one year old, so... Happy birthday, PSVR 2? I've had mine for just over a year now. I was a launch day adopter, so on the 22nd of February 2023, I got my first experience of virtual reality at home. And still my only experience of VR at home. I've had experiences with other kit elsewhere, like the local VR arcade, or at places like friends' houses and comic cons, but nothing persistent. And that's a very good place to offer a view of this headset from, because for most adopters, it's going to be the exact or very similar place that they are coming from. Now for once, I want to start with some of the challenges. Because for VR, more than any other gaming style, those challenges are going to have a much bigger impact on the individual. And let's get an obvious one out of the way. The cable. Yes, PSVR 2 is a wired headset, unlike alternatives such as the MetaQuest 3, Timax Crystal or Apple Vision Pro. Now, we'll cover those competitors more shortly, but this wire can impact your gameplay. Titles like Before You Fall, Horizon Call of the Mountain, Synapse, Crossfire Sierra Squad, even Beat Saber that require a full range of movement can be impacted by the cable. Now being honest, it isn't a huge impact, and the positives of being wired for me far outweigh the negatives. But I have got caught up in it, or stood on it in game sessions on multiple occasions, and this has resulted in more than one game over screen. Tracking is another challenge. Now this particular challenge is not unique to PlayStation VR 2. Most headsets, regardless of their tracking method, will have tracking issues from time to time. That statement doesn't make a loss of tracking during gameplay acceptable though. When I can't mine in No Man's Sky because my headset can't see my right sense controller which is directly in front of it, it negatively impacts my game time. I've had sabers go missing mid-song, guns spiral in my hands because one controller isn't tracking properly, and so on. It's incredibly frustrating when precision is required in a title. Like I say though, this challenge is true of any VR setup. Even the hugely expensive and fully room scale setups like Vive, with their light boxes and such. So maybe attribute this to VR as a general and not just PlayStation VR 2, but worth being aware of anyway. There is then the cost. Over a year after launch, the price of the headset remains at £569 new for the version that has Call of the Mountain included, like my one here. That's more than the console that it has to attach to in order to work. It's a lot to outlay on a PlayStation 5 accessory. Here in the UK, it's over a third of the monthly minimum wage, and having launched in the height of a cost of living crisis makes that asking price even higher. But bear in mind that the PlayStation VR 2 is £529 on its own, whereas the Pimax Crystal is over £1,600 and the Apple Vision Pro is over £3,500, and not available outside of the US. I chose those specific headsets because their displays, tracking, features and experience are the closest match on paper to the PlayStation VR 2, and they are grossly more expensive. The closest competitor in terms of cost is the MetaQuest 3. The base model there has 128GB of internal storage and is £479. Now that is cheaper than the PSVR 2, and it runs on its own, no additional hardware required. It also has a much bigger selection of games with backwards compatibility and is the most prominent headset on the market. But MetaQuest 3 games are bigger than those on Quest 2, which means that 128GB version is likely not going to be enough for most gamers, especially considering the like of Asgod's Wrath 2, a Quest exclusive title with Quest 3 enhancements, is 30 gigabytes on its own. Add in Assassin's Creed Nexus VR, also only available on Quest at 16 gigabytes, and nearly half of your storage is taken up with just two games. To upgrade the storage of the Quest 3, it is suddenly costing 619 pounds. Now yes, you get Asgod's Wrath 2 included with that price, at least at the time of writing, but for 569 pounds, 
you get the PlayStation VR 2 and Horizon Call of the Mountain. With one terabyte as standard on the PlayStation 5 as well, those storage concerns of the base model Quest 3 aren't present with this headset. But truth be told, they are a fairly even match. So the cost of the PSVR 2 is not outlandish. It's actually fairly special in the VR space, coming in at under the £1,000 mark, especially with its specs. But I have major challenges with the spatial recognition of the headset. The PSVR 2 says that you need a 2m by 2m square space to play room scale VR content. Room scale, for those who aren't aware, are the ones where all of your body movements are included in game. So you move in three dimensions and create the gameplay. This is where I play VR, in my living room, as most people will. And as you can see from my tape measure here, I have more than a 2m by 2m space. When I try to play room scale games on PSVR 2 though, this error message pops up. And there is no way to overcome this. There are no means to input the measurements, no way to include a tape measure for accuracy, no way to override the situation at all. And it means you end up locked in lengthy arguments with PlayStation to get a refund when a room scale game doesn't work despite you, the player, doing everything right. And this is a huge problem for the PSVR 2 as it can drastically diminish your available game library. I really want to play Broken Edge, for example, but as that is a room scale only game and the PlayStation VR 2 doesn't recognize the actual space that I have available, I can't. I couldn't be bothered having another two month argument with PlayStation over Lay Mills Body Combat, a fitness program for the VR 2. So it sits in my library completely unusable and a waste of money. Possibly my biggest negative point though, is the battery life of the Sense controllers. Now these things are great. Having used Quest and Vive controllers elsewhere, I must say I think the Sense controllers are my favorite VR controllers yet. They don't take up tons of space, feel unwieldy, or use double A batteries that constantly want to jump out of the controller through your window. But, and it is a big but, they have a meager four-ish hours of battery life. Now a lot of people will tell you that that's no problem. You're never playing more than four hours in VR anyway. But I have, or at least wanted to. But the low battery life means my time is capped at four hours because you cannot use the sense controllers while they are charging. So even things like battery packs do not help here. There is a finite time on the amount you can play. And if you forget to charge them between sessions, that limit can be as low as 10 minutes of gameplay before they turn off. On such a high priced premium accessory, limits and blockers to entry such as battery and charging don't feel acceptable. At least let me charge the things with a battery pack and keep using them. That'd solve the whole issue. But that's all of my negatives after a year. And as you can see, I do have positive angles to most of them. So, what about the good stuff? Well, the headset and controllers are incredibly well designed. That's why when you go searching for PlayStation VR 2 accessories to buy, it's more niche options, like these extended handles for Beat Saber. You can get two-handed gun stocks, which is great for games like Crossfire Sierra Squad or Pavlov VR. And there are additional straps out there, like this review unit that VR Cover sent to me. And they do help in certain aspects, like sweat absorption in physical titles, an additional overhead strap if needed, and keeping the headset clean. I wouldn't say these sorts of accessories are required though. Without VR Cover having sent this to me for review, I would never have felt the need to purchase one because the design and fit, even without this cover, is perfect for me. Most accessories therefore focus on charging, storage, and mini speakers. That's how good the general design is. There isn't a huge requirement to fix the fit. The screens and the refresh rate are stunning. With 4K resolution, 120 frames per second, eye tracking and foveated rendering, the visual experience inside the headset is second to none. It's crisp and clear wherever you're looking and the headset reacts super fast to eye movement. So you never notice other areas being a lower poly count. Because the headset is lightweight, prolonged gaming sessions are really easy. 
add in that the screens do not actually rest upon your face like in basically every other VR headset, but are suspended in front of it, there's never pressure sores or face indentations when you finish using the PSVR 2. It just makes for a much more comfortable overall VR experience. The haptic feedback of both the Sense controllers and the headset itself immerse you far further into a game than I can describe. Feeling the impact of an axe on a shield or a saber on a block seem like such little things to highlight as positive points, but they heighten the experience more than I can describe. The 3D audio paired with that allows for quick reactions in games like Synapse when someone is coming up behind you and you can react to it. You use your known instinctive real world senses to react in game and feel that reaction fed back to you through nuanced haptics. I absolutely love it. The software library has also continued to grow since launch, with parity releases alongside PC VR like Beat the Beat, Crossfire Sierra Squad and Metro Awakening, the headset remains current and relevant alongside its PC counterparts. Games have been coming in all genres too, from the hilarious work-based games like Not For Broadcast to the cartoony Kill It With Fire. We've also received the spooky roguelike Foglands and fun platformers like Stilt. There's platform exclusives like the psychedelic shooter Synapse, the team shooter Firewall Ultra, the ultimate sim driving experience in Gran Turismo 7, and the platform showcase Call of the Mountain. We've also had a slew of health apps and educational ones like Human Anatomy VR, and massive RPGs like Journey to Foundation, No Man's Sky, and The Wizard's Dark Times Brotherhood. The support in terms of games has felt great. And let's be very honest here, software is vital to the longevity of a VR headset. It can be as technologically advanced as it wants to be, but if there are no games or applications for it, it's not gonna keep people playing and using the headset. I think for the most part, Sony have succeeded in keeping quality and variety coming to their headset over the first year. The biggest thing though, a huge factor that helps to elevate this beyond pretty much any other VR headset, is that it just works. There's no troubleshooting for hours at a time for an audio issue or fuzzy visuals when all you want to do is play. The headset is exactly like the console that it attaches to. Turn it on and it works. There's no lack of recognition when you plug it in, as can be experienced with PC VR and Questlink. There's no manual driver updates, no game tweaking for just an acceptable experience. With PlayStation VR 2, it is as plug and play as they come, and it is automatically the best possible experience when doing that. It makes the entire VR experience simple, effective, and incredibly accessible. But like most things PlayStation at the moment, Sony are very quiet overall about it. We have platform exclusives, and a fair amount of them for the device's first year on the market. But we don't know of any new ones coming down the line. Least of all from Sony first party studios, which have recently been decimated with an 8% reduction worldwide. That isn't what I would call confidence inspiring. Despite what I would personally call a solid and successful first year on the market. In the calendar year of 2023, Industry analysts believe PlayStation VR 2 was the second best selling VR headset in the world. If that's true, that is a huge achievement considering the established competition. But we have no official figures to work off. Sony last said anything back in May 2023 when they stated sales figures of 600,000. I would have personally expected a bit of a fanfare the moment they sold through 1 million units. Alas, no such celebration has been broadcast. Big third-party titles still chose to skip the headset in 2023, like Ubisoft's Assassin's Creed Nexus VR. Despite a huge portion of that series' fanbase being console players, Ubisoft chose to only launch that game on meta platforms, even denying PC VR access. Reasons given were low uptake, small install base, storefront costs, and pricing, etc. All are valid points, but I feel they also miss the point? That install base won't increase if there aren't solid software reasons to invest. Think of it like the console seller exclusives like Tears of the Kingdom, and the overall library of a console that makes people choose red, green or blue in the first place. 
People weigh up the PlayStation exclusives with the third party offerings when choosing to buy a console. And VR is exactly the same. As a VR headset connected to a console that runs other games too, where series fans already play, not launching the VR title in that series on that headset that fans can easily access hurts both the software sales and the headset attraction. Ubisoft, among many others in recent memory, have bemoaned how low their VR games are performing when only launching on the one platform. For most of these companies, this need not be the case. As a third-party publisher, why not branch out and launch on all VR platforms? Why not give yourself multiple sources of sales? Why as a platform holder in PlayStation, especially in the instance of something like Assassin's Creed, are Sony not meeting regularly with third-party publishers to bring those games to PlayStation VR 2? These are the type of questions that hopeful adopters want answered before taking the plunge, as well as if the perceived high cost is worth it. Now, I don't have any form of clairvoyance. I cannot see or discern the future. I can make predictions based on industry trends and rumblings, but they would be guesses in all honesty. I don't know if the software game of the PlayStation VR 2 will pick up, but I do expect that it will. Sony have been testing the PlayStation VR 2 as a PC VR headset recently, with a hopeful launch later in 2024. This could be an absolute catalyst for the headset. Its specs at its price undercut similar performing PC VR headsets by over a thousand pounds. This would make it an almost default purchase for PC VR adopters and upgraders. With an increased install base across two platforms at that point, developers are going to instigate many of its included features in gameplay, because you develop for the common platforms and their strengths. When doing that, there is then no reason to not launch on PC and PSVR at the exact same time, keeping the headset up to date and current regardless of where you play. Unlike the PlayStation Vita, I feel Sony are making good moves behind the scenes with PSVR 2, even if we don't currently have more first party exclusives on the horizon. Overall, I do think the PlayStation VR 2 is worth it. I've had an incredible first year with the headset and loved my VR journey so far. I can definitely recommend it to anyone thinking about getting one. Oh, but Doragon, what about the price? It's over a thousand pound for the console and headset. Now, technically, yes, but if you were at the point of considering purchasing a PlayStation VR 2, you already have a PlayStation 5 to use it with. Just like if you're considering the £1,600 Pimax Crystal PC VR's comparatively spec headset, you already have the £3,000 PC to use that with. The base PC or console isn't part of the equation when shopping for just a VR headset. To address that point of price though, the Pimax Crystal is £1,600 for just the headset. And for the same price, you can buy the PSVR 2, a PS5, and nearly the entire PSVR 2 game library. The cost is always, of course, relative. Personally, I've had the £529 worth of entertainment out of the PlayStation VR 2, and I will continue to get value from the hardware and the software that I already own. Any future software, therefore, only needs to justify its own existence, not that of the headset as well. If you have been contemplating a PlayStation VR 2, because it is the cheapest, the easiest, or the only way that you can access virtual reality at home, I personally think you should go for it. I do not think you'll be disappointed. If you have other options like Quest or PC VR, I think PlayStation VR 2 should remain part of the equation, especially with the probability of multi-platform support in the near future, let alone experiences only available on that platform like Gran Turismo 7. I've been fully won over by the hardware, the software, and the aftermarket support, which I have had to use, in my first year with PlayStation VR 2. I'm optimistic about the future of the headset and hopeful about the software. It's been a while since I've been this positive about a gaming product, and I'm glad that it is this, a virtual reality headset and its ecosystem, that has reignited that for me. I would like to thank you all very much for watching. If you've enjoyed this content, consider one of these other videos, and in the meantime folks, have yourselves a fantastic day, and take care.